So first of all, just thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to come talk to you this afternoon. Um, I'm really excited to be here and hope we have a good interactive ses session and any questions you'd like to have. Uh, I suppose just a little bit to perhaps just give you an insight into the Irish psyche. I think we're like the, the smaller brother to the New Zealanders in a lot of ways, you know, whether we're talking about sports in terms of rugby or we're talking about dairy farming, we celebrate your successes. But when we get the opportunity to give you a bloody nose, like two weeks ago, we're going to celebrate that for a long time. So, we're just starting. In terms of my presentation today, basically, what I want you to take from it is that, as grass-based dairy farmers, you are unique. Okay? Um, we know the statistics. In terms of world milk production, people often quote, it's about 10% of world milk production from pastoral fiscal. I actually say it's less than that. Okay? If you think about real pastoral-based milk production. And in terms of that, then, that, that has huge implications. It means in terms of what we're talking about, what your goals, how you produce milk, the things you need to be considering, the things that you, know, you shouldn't consider, they're different to everybody else. Okay, so in terms of all the decisions, big and small in your farm, you have to be really clear about what you're doing. We've got great presentations before lunch about profitable dairy farm. You know, it's really, really different business to anywhere else in the world. So you need to be really clear about what drives your system. I'm just going to go through some of the science that supports that. So briefly, by way of context, I would contend that this is probably the best time ever to be a grass-based dairy industry. Okay? We know the world population is growing. They're increasingly demanding animal proteins. They're urban populations. They're living longer. They value the products you produce in passport systems to a greater extent. Okay, so that's a fantastic starting point. This graphic up here on the right-hand side, just shows you the FAO expectations for the next 10 years. You know, we've had massive growth in demand in the last 10 years, it's going to continue because people value the product you produce. That's a great starting point. Customers are more engaged. We hear it all the time, we're talking about vegans endlessly. It's about 1% of the, of the population. It's tiny. But customers in general are massively engaged in how their food is produced. Young people in particular, they, they have less you know, confidence in big brands and in terms of large-scale processes. They're interested in healthfulness. They're interested in authenticity. They're interested in how their nutrients are produced, and they want to know more about your farm systems. How you're producing food in the next 10 years has to be about communicating more about that food production process to them. And you know, there's a fair-minded middle there that are all ears. So what are we doing about it? Internationally, there's increasing evidence and knowledge now about the benefits of grazing systems in terms of the whole jigsaw, in terms of the, you know, producing product in a profitable way, but the environmental piece, you know, the quality of products, there's a huge story there. And you might say, you know, a farmer in the audience might, might say, well, we know about this, we've heard about this for years. That story is increasing all the time, okay? So, you know, from a European perspective, certainly, the science is showing what you're doing is different all the time, of great value. And we need, to, we need to tell that story more. And productivity is improving too. So if we were talking about a New Zealand farm in the 1960s or an Irish farm in the 1960s to the present day, well, productivity in terms of a pastoral system and an animal on pasture has doubled in that period. So, you know, it's not insignificant. There is progress there as well. So, you know, there's good stories there. But there are challenges too. And this graphic has been shown a few times. Volatility of milk prices. I'm just showing you the Irish price is the German price, they're effectively the same price anyway. The US price and the New Zealand price. So we can divide that graphic into two parts. Pre-2005-06, stable prices. Post-2006, huge volatility. Slightly increase in price, but huge volatility. Two things to take in mind with that. Just like Greg Brodie has showed actually earlier on, the impact that has on profitability in terms of the annual profitability of the farm is huge. It's three and a half fold in an Irish context. Between the trough in the market in 2009, where profits on, per hectare on farm are about 400 euros, and the peak in the market in 2013 14, was about a three and a half fold increase in terms of profitability at high mid prices. Okay, so it's having a big effect. Think of any other business. You will struggle to think of another business that has such an external factor having such a huge effect on farm profitability. The second thing to say about that is the uncertainty it creates. Okay, because it's natural for people to say, well, this is a change factor. So how do I need to adjust my business to, you know, people talk about taking advantage of an opportunity. I put it to you, really, that that creates far more uncertainty and problems in most pastoral dairy farm systems 
than actually opportunities. Look at the graphic, it's going up and down. How can you consider that an opportunity? It's volatility. Next year, what you do this year, and next year, you know, totally different things. And that's not what we're about in terms of farms, and that's not what we're about in terms of farm systems. We can't open the papers now or look online without a big focus on the environment. And that's, that's good, I have no problem with that. I think that's a really healthy debate to have, you know, in terms of climate change, biodiversity loss, pollution, and so on. Competition for feeds with other sources. We're, we're making choices all the time in terms of using food. Increasingly what we're being asked to do now as farmers, as researchers in industry, is to produce food, produce more of it, but produce it with a whole load of other non-market benefits. So be they, you know, climate change mitigation, be it biodiversity, better animal welfare, better product quality. These are the things our customers are demanding of us. In terms of the challenge, I want to put this challenge back to you as farmers. That's a tough challenge for you is to produce more food in a way that is more efficient, and based on you know better efficiency of non-recoverable feed by humans. So grassland is 25% of the utilizable world grassland area, or world, world agricultural area, it's 90% of New Zealand and Ireland. It's inedible to humans, but it delivers a whole lot of other parts of the jigsaw that we want, conservation and so on. So can we produce food really, really efficiently and deliver upon these benefits for people with fewer chemicals, fewer interventions and so on? That's really the challenge as I see it. In my mind, the grass-based systems that we have today and that we can deliver in the future are best place of any system that we could choose to deliver on these challenges. That's a key point. Okay, so better implemented grazing systems to me, in terms of the scientific evidence, show that they are the best possible systems in terms of meeting these challenges and meeting these consumer requirements in the future. So we talked a lot about resilience this morning, and I suppose I want to kind of, we need to give a definition to resilience and what we mean by that. So in science at least, resilience comes from ecology, and the study of plants and how they adapt in time. And while farmers might like it, the best plant, or the plant that denotes resilience in ecology is the reed. Because if you want to think of a storm, and what a storm does, and the, the, you know, the chaos it creates, um, and people think of big oak trees with deep roots, well they tumble over when you've got a bad storm. Okay, the reed doesn't. It blows in the breeze, it's really flexible and adaptable, and when the storm abates, it returns to its essential function. Okay? And that's what we need to think about in terms of farm systems. We want farm systems that can deal with the challenges that we face, the uncertainties, but deliver in terms of long-term essential function. So that's the symbolism I want you to keep in mind as we talk about these farm systems and what grassland contributes to that. I suppose the other thing to be careful about as well is that while the problems we face are quite complex, we know that the solutions have to be simple and adaptable at farm level. Busy businesses where there isn't a lot of time for complexity. There isn't a lot of time, there's no more time, you know, for more complicated decisions and, and you know, more sophisticated ways of doing things. These things have to be embedded simply in how we farm. Every day, every single decision. So that's a challenge. And my boss often, you know, throws it back on me and we're looking at new research on what we want to do. Well, he's got a checklist of three or four things that he wants, any research has to deliver. It has to improve the likelihood of farmers. And by that, it has to insulate their farm businesses in terms of profitability, be it in terms of milk price or in terms of climate. So, you know, it has to run counter signal pill to some of this volatility. It has to be simple and labor efficient. As I said, it has to be easy and adaptable. And we have to be able to improve the decision making process at farm level. And it needs to improve on these other things that consumers are now really, really interested in and that we need to deliver upon, be they in terms of improved products, environment, animal welfare, and so on. So if it doesn't, the new research doesn't tick those boxes, he's not interested. And that really focuses the mind in terms of where we go from here. In terms of delivery of this system, I have the easy job today. I'm following the lads earlier on. So there's, we've had the two excellent presentations before lunch. I'm not going to add in terms of how to do that. It's about matching that grass growth curve to demand that grass growth curve, achieving, achieving a really good alignment, utilizing the pasture produced on your farm, keeping it as simple as possible. So that's really the, that's really the blueprint, the, the basis for what we're talking about in terms of milk production. Um, on that basis, we need a different type of animal to others. We need an animal that's really robust, really, really fertile, compact cattle, to utilize that feed really, really efficiently. So, you know, we've got a lot of detail in terms of how to do that, 
error, so I'm not going to add in terms of that. <clears throat> Economic imperatives. It has to be profitable. It has to improve the livelihoods of farmers. So there's two things to say about that. First one is, well, you know, there are very few things you can measure at farm level that influence farm profitability. But you've got one really good one, and that's pasture eating. More pasture eating on any dairy farm, any farmer in this audience, eat more pasture per hectare, their profitability is higher. Okay, so that's a fantastic place to start. Now we've got something we can measure in our systems that really well reflects profitability. And in New Zealand or Ireland or anywhere else, as the lads have said earlier, that figure is pretty consistent. So very, very clear. The second one is in terms of cost of production. And this is a study done in Ireland a number of years ago where we looked at data internationally in terms of use of pasture in, animal di in the diets of our dairy herds and its impact on cost of production at farm level. We have to have low production costs. So this data just shows you the range of production systems from the US confinement on the extreme left right across to the traditional Australian and New Zealand um, dairy industries of the, the, dare I say, the 2005-2007 period. Very high level of pasture, low level of supplementary feeding. There's a clear relationship. More pasture you buy, lower are the cost of production. But the story is even more complex than that. I've divided the graphic in two. On the left hand side you've got areas where pasture contributes relatively little to the total uh, diet of the animals. And there's a whole load of other capital infrastructure involved. So in the systems on the left, about 20% of the total cost relates to depreciation. Something that cannot be fixed by having more grass in the diet. Okay, so that's really curtailing their ability to be low cost producers by using grass. On the right hand side, you've got the slope that Mike talked about earlier. Higher proportions of grass in the diet having significant effects in terms of reducing total cost of production. In those systems, feed is a big cost, so by using more pasture and less of everything else, it significantly reduce costs. The second thing to be aware of, in terms of that uniqueness of your systems, is in terms of, you know, focusing on productivity. So, I'm happy for anyone in this room to talk about productivity, because, you know, it's natural to say, how could you do things better? That's a very reasonable question to ask. But as a grass-based farmer, the answer to that question is totally different. This graphic here shows you the relationship between allocating feed on the bottom axis and if we just focus for a second on the orange line there, the animal intake. So we can increase animal performance in grazing systems. And that orange line shows you the response curve in terms of feeding animals better at pasture. You can see it's a curvy linear response curve. And what should frighten anyone when you look at that response curve is it slopes off very, very fast. On average, to increase an animal's intake in a pasture system across loads of studies, it shows you need to offer them four kilos more feed. Okay? So I don't think too many here would be happy with that return in terms of cost of growing feed and so on in its return. The other thing to bear in mind is we talked about pasture eating and utilization. Well, we know that the more feed we offer those animals, the green light kicks in. We reduce utilization. And it's like a, it's like a, a bad comedy. You know, when you, 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 your, your, your intention is to increase productivity, you offer the animal more feed. The unintended consequence, the utilization drops, subsequent quality drops, and subsequent the animal performance is also reduced. So, you know, in terms of it, the uniqueness of what you're trying to do, you're looking to be right in the middle of this, this graph. You're trying to achieve relatively high levels of performance, but maintain utilization and quality so the subsequent animal performance is not declining. Earlier this year, I served as the science editor for the European Grassland Conference. And uh, maybe it shouldn't have come as a surprise to me, but when you look at all the stories across Europe in terms of the environmental uh, efficiency of grazing systems and so on, I kind of look at them a little bit like, you know, they're the poor relations because they're so, their, their ability to grow new place pasture is so much less than yours or indeed in Ireland. But yet the stories were all really, really clear. You know, they've made lots of different choices and so on over the last decade, and when they've reviewed them, they've come back to the table and they've said basically with great honesty that, you know, grassland systems, they made a mistake going away from them. And in terms of whether we're talking about, you know, biological filters to hold nutrients in the soil solution and utilize them efficiently or carbon sequestration, you know, grassland systems offer us the best potential to be environmentally efficient. It should be a strength and considered a strength for our industries rather than a weakness. Okay, so we need to do something better if, it's, if we're considering it a weakness and there's a big focus on that, we're doing something wrong because it's a big actual strength for us in the long term. In terms of, I suppose, that balance again, the question is, well, if we intensify, you know, how far can we intensify and what's the implications of intensification? There are many that would have us believe that we should have no animals 
or very few animals, in really extensive production models. The science does not support that. So if you look on the left hand side here, really extensive production systems, you know, where you have really low stocking rates, we all know the effect of that intuitively. It's leading to low pasture productivity represented by the green line and low animal productivity. Totally inefficient and unprofitable systems. And no real benefits in terms of environmental things. Now this just shows you the carbon sequestration, but equally I could have showed you the nitrate curves for this graphic. There is a midpoint here in terms of production systems in this spectrum of how we can do grazing systems. That is, delivering high levels of pasture utilization, high levels of productivity, and maintaining the environmental benefits of our grazing systems. Really, you know, binding carbon and nutrients, upregulating nutrient cycles, and really, really efficient in terms of their use. And that's really what we're striving for. And we know that if we go beyond that, we're going to see some detrimental effects in terms of use of supplements and use of extra fertilizer and so on. That's where the environmental problems arise. So people ask, you know, is, is it a, is, is, is a grass systems, are they a carbon sink or a source? Depends on where you are. A well implemented grazing system absorbs carbon, really, really efficient. Poorly implemented, either side, you're dealing with low levels of sequestration, you're dealing with problems. Okay, so we have to implement our systems better. Stocking rate, we can't really talk about our systems without talking about stocking rate. It is fundamental. What is the right stocking rate? So I'm just, what we did here was basically we, we, we looked at stocking rate across the, the period 1960 to 2009, uh, back in, in 2009. And we took all the studies in New Zealand and we put them all together because that's a particular way of farming. It's quite different to the European systems. And this is the graphic that, that came out of that evaluation of all those studies. There's about 60 of them in the analysis. A strong positive relationship between stocking rate and productivity per hectare on farms. And to summarize that, every one cow per hectare increase in stocking rate resulted in a reduction in per cow performance by about 9% in milk salads, about an 11% increase in milk salads per hectare, and a shorter lactation, shorter lactation rates. Okay, so that's your data that I'm using in terms of the effects of uh, stocking rate. And really shows the benefit in terms of productivity. No difference in supplements, no difference in fertilizers. These are all controlled experiments. So this is the benefits of highly productive grazing swarms. Okay, and it's driven by purely by pasture, exactly the figure the farmers talked about before lunch. But we've confused that story. We've confused that story with something else entirely, importing feeds into that system and the impacts that has. So whether we're talking really about nitrogen fertilizers or whether we're talking about imported feeds, that's adding in nutrients into the system and that changes this basic story. And it's associated with negative effects. So we need to disentangle those two things and think about them separately when we're talking about our farming system. <coughs> so what's the appropriate stock rate? We've done loads of experiments now where we've looked at low and high stock rates and their impact in terms of productivity and performance and profitability. And we keep coming back to this figure which actually derives from New Zealand. The ideal stock rate is about 80 to 90 kilos of light weight per ton of available feed. And that's based on studies done in New Zealand. Okay, so exactly the same. The biological responses in Ireland and New Zealand are identical. Okay, and I suppose the, the slight difference for us is that when we talk to our farmers about stocking rate, this is what we show them. We show them a matrix with grass growth across the top and the amount of supplements that they're reasonably prepared to include in their systems down along the side. And the appropriate stocking rate then is based on those two combinations. And we've probably gone a little bit further, possibly, than you in terms of defining that, and that we do not want them using lots of supplements, because we, we're back to that environmental consequence. So if you take the average dairy farmer today in Ireland, they're stocked at about two livestock units per hectare, growing about 10 tons, and using about a ton of supplement. They're stocked on average at the right level, but they're at a really high level of supplementary feed. And what we want them to do, and what our best farmers are doing, is they've increased their stocking rates, They've increased focus on pasture and pasture utilization, and they've reduced their use of supplements. And I'll show you the evidence for this and what the impacts of that are on profitability gain, but they are positive whether we talk about profits, environmental efficiency, or any of the other metrics that we have in our systems. But it requires discipline, and it requires good management. And I don't fully buy into the notion that, you know, well-managed pasture systems are, you know, just breezy easy, readily managed system. When you look around, it requires a lot of clarity. Okay, and that's good management to me. So whether we're talking about pasture covers, you know, distance and rotation lengths at various times of the year, grazing intensity, fundamental, and use of supplements. When, is, when can we use them, when can't we use them? 
These are all the things you have to be really clear about when you're talking about the use of stocking rates in the driving farming system. And I would also add that this is probably, in as much as farming systems can be strategic, this is a strategic factor. And by that I mean that if you get the wrong stocking rate, it's really difficult to have a system that delivers upon the other KPIs. So you're going to have to make your peace with this one, unfortunately, get the right stocking rate for the farm. And that's for a 500 kilo, 525 kilo cow, that's the Irish data, I didn't change it. In the, in the paper that's submitted with the conference, there's detailed information for smaller cows, larger cows, and for the kind of New Zealand uh, circumstances. I'd encourage you to have a, a good look at that. Okay, so just in terms of the environment, in terms of stocking rate. We've done a number of studies now, and we're constantly measuring uh, the environmental effects for different stocking rates. This graphic here shows you total nitrate, total nitrogen concentration. So nitrate, nitrite, and ammonia loss from the different stocking rates in our now this is within the range of about two and a half to three point three cows per hectare. We've looked at the effect of stocking rate on nutrient loss. There is no relationship. Okay, that shouldn't surprise any of you. These systems are based on pasture, there's no extra supplements coming in, there's no there's no impact in terms of loss pathways within that that kind of biological optimum in terms of stocking rate. So the evidence is clear. In New Zealand you've actually gone further and studies here have shown actually that if you can combine a high stocking rate to utilize pasture through that main part of the growing season with you know early culling of animals in autumn, you can drop down that stocking rate and the risk in autumn in terms of nutrient losses, and you can actually reduce total nutrient losses by virtue of the high productivity, high productivity system combined with the low level of risk in autumn. So you know, really encouraging story there. Breeding. I can't talk about resilience without talking about the animal. And you know, it's impossible. This is a graphic just published in the last couple of months in terms of breeding international breeding programs and all the various countries are there. There's a whole lot of things for breeding for now. Okay, and this was done again back in 2004 where they reviewed all the different uh, emphasis in all the different countries. And the one thing I, observation I'd make on that is that internationally we've moved from over the last 15-20 years from selecting about you know 60% of the emphasis back there around the 2000s being on production about you know 40% on other traits. That has actually swung over now in most countries. Most of the emphasis on robustness, health traits, with a much lower emphasis on kind of, you know, productivity traits. Such is the importance in all systems of health and robustness of animals. Just to deal specifically with the Irish example, um, the EBI. This is the EBI and how it has evolved over the next over the last 20 years. So you'll meet Donna tomorrow. He's, uh, he's in the audience. So anyone who can give him a bloody nose in terms of what we're doing in genetics in Ireland, you have my. Uh, you have my uh, support because uh, you know we need to make more progress. So in our index, we're down to about 30% emphasis on production, and uh, you know we are making progress in terms of of fertility and health traits. And uh, one of Donna's students has just published recently that the average Irish dairy cow in 2017 produced about 58 kilos more milk solids than they did in the year 2000, and they survived for about an extra 175 days in the herd. So we are making progress, but I think we need to do better. So. Yeah, I'll be in there with you tomorrow if you want to have a go. So, <laughs> look, just in terms of the levers, I suppose, just clarity, you're unique. What's driving this? Elite genetics, high productivity animals that are suited to a grazing system. Stocking rates. For our farmers, the top 10% farms are higher stock than the average farm. And we think we can go further, actually. Higher recalving rates, you know, animals that calve compactly at the start of the season, the best farmers are doing it, they're getting much greater results, and they're utilizing more pasture as a consequence of that. In terms of the benefits of that, productivity is high in grazing systems that combine these levers well. So I haven't talked about supplements, I haven't talked about fertilizers, that's because they're not part of this story. High productivity grazing systems driven by compact having and a real focus on pasture is what's driving the productivity in our systems. And that it delivers really low production costs, which was the other aspect that we were looking for. And the benefits, high, high profitability, longer lasting animals, animals that are more mature, that survive longer and reflect their superior you know, health and welfare in our systems. And I picked the carbon footprint as one example, but I may have been picked from nitrate leached or whatever. More environmentally compliant production systems in the future. So all of the facets lining up really, really well in terms of what we're aiming for. Future improvement areas, it shouldn't surprise anyone for me, it's all about improved animals and improved sport. So in terms of the animals, better health and welfare, determining, identifying new traits and selecting for them, better product quality, uh, improved environmental efficiency, 
in terms of sports. It's an area I think we can do better on. The history certainly isn't good in terms of in terms of sport productivity. But there's some really exciting studies now going on both here and in Ireland to look at improving the productivity of swords. And I think there will be benefits for farmers there over the next 10 years. Reducing reliance on chemical fertilizers, using more clovers, upregulating clover performance in our swords. You know, uh, I suppose big data is a big one for us in terms of a national grassland database that you can compare with. And there are initiatives here just to do the same. So using the data that's there to, to support better systems. Finally then, in terms of product differentiation, Working in a research centre, I have a pretty close relationship with a lot of the food scientists, and they can tell you so much more about grip now than even they could, you know, five years ago. And whether a grass growth is low or high, or whether you know they've got in a supplement or whatever, they can tell you based on just looking at the grip. So I'm really encouraged that we will be able to say more about our systems in the future, be it in terms of the animals, the environmental footprint, or indeed the big ones that are mentioned this morning, improving the value of our product and being able to select again, even to drive that value further in the future. That capacity is there, but we need to work together better on it. So to conclude, you are unique, your systems are unique, and how you're going to produce product in a better way in the future is unique. And I believe that if we think of the productivity, the profitability, the environmental footprint, your, your competitiveness is actually increasing relative to others. If you consider the whole package of what customers are looking for. It's going to be based on good basics, just like it has always been, just like we've seen before lunch and increasingly differentiating ourselves from others and other production systems. And that's the challenge for the future. In terms of just to say a few thank yous, I'd like to acknowledge the Irish dairy farmers without which this type of research wouldn't be possible for us, so that's really, really important. And also just to mention a few people who <laughs> have made a big contribution to us. So there's a lot of people who have left these shores over the last number of years and they've contributed to the better Irish dairy industry. And you know, to a person, their, you know, their positivity, their energy, their sharing of ideas has contributed greatly. And uh, we want that to continue and even develop further into the future. So thank you very much.